I'd just like to take this opportunity to um, introduce some members of our team. First, this is Gene Raymond, and he is the lead designer from uh, Raymond uh, Design and Associates. So mm -hmm. welcome, Gene. Thank you. And, Thank you. and also uh, Mr. John Garish, who is our chair of our school building committee and has done a lot of work in the last year and a half to help us to get to this process. So thank you for being here, Mr. Garish. <laughs> okay, we're here at the uh, Mitchell School. I'm here with Superintendent Derek Swenson. And uh, Derek, of course, we do have a vote coming up here in just about a month from now. And uh, today we're gonna take a little bit of a, a tour of the facility and have you guys kind of talk about where we're at and where we're going. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, um, as you know, we had a roof collapse here in February of 2015. Since that time, we've gone through the eligibility and the feasibility stage of uh, the MSBA project and process. Um, as of uh, August 28th, MSBA uh, approved our schematic design and project budget. And now the town council have voted to put it as a ballot question for a special election that will take place on Saturday, October 19th. Um, and we encourage all of our Bridgewater uh, registered voters to get out and vote on that day. Okay, so we'll uh, take a little tour. So this was our computer suite and um, one of the, the morning soon after the initial collapse on the other side, uh, we did have a um, bursted pipe that created flooding in this area. At that point, it was all uh, drywall. Um, when we did remove that drywall, and we had, and we saw that these you know, steel studs uh, did have that rusting, and through the structural assessment that RDA um, conducted, it, it, it was um, determined that this was pre-existing. It was not a result of the flood. This was definitely uh, something that was due to, as um, Mr. Raymond just explained, the, the moisture that was getting trapped within our walls because of uh, the uh, air quality and moisture issues that we're having because of the exterior walls. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of ceiling grid which was rusted which you wouldn't expect, you know, you'd expect that in a building that had high humidity levels. Uh, and uh, the high humidity is what led to the poor air quality. But there were a lot of, a lot of places where we uh, found rust kind of halfway up the, the stud and it was nowhere near where the, where the water had been. I think the water was ankle deep when, when the pipe burst. Yeah. But you can, see the, you can see the damage because it flooded upstairs and then everything down on this lower level had to be removed down to the studs to avoid a mold issue. So we're in the area where the actual collapse took place back in February of 15. Luckily it was um, over February vacation and there were no students or staff within the building. Custodian was doing uh, his rounds, noticed a slight uh, dip in the, in the ceiling, um, called the building inspector, called fire and police. Um, I came on to site along with, uh, at the time, our director of facilities, Al Baroncelli and by morning's end, it was a full collapse. The roof had collapsed in. Um, later uh, uh, that, that year, we um, reached out to Raymond uh, Design and Associates and asked them to do a structural assessment uh, of uh, not only this area, but the entire uh, building. And Gene can speak to some of the things that, um, you know, pre-existing issues that were um, identified through that uh, structural uh, assessment of the building. Great, thanks Derek. We, um, we were hired to come in, as Derek said, just to uh, take a look at the roof structure because there was concern if there was a collapse in one area that uh, what, what might lurk in other areas. Um, so we came in, we spent many, many months. We had a very thorough structural investigation. Uh, the way the building is structured is there's a, uh, a steel frame up to the kind of the top of the windows and everything above the windows, all the pitched roofs that you see are, uh, are based on wood trusses. Um, and we were up in the attic for, as I said, months, looked at every single truss, which numbered in the hundreds, uh, and documented a slew of uh, structural deficiencies, either in the manufacturing of the trusses 
or the installation of the trusses. But um, when it was all said and done, we determined that it would be millions of dollars. The, first of all, the entire roof had to be replaced, but it would be millions of dollars to do that, but it would be even more expensive uh, and labor intensive given the working uh, conditions up above the ceilings to actually try to repair all these trusses. And you, you know, here there's some various photographs we have of cracked trusses, there's lack of bridging, there's areas where, uh, again, there's manufacturing defects like the trusses in the gym were actually constructed uh, kind of upside down using, you know, the members on the top were actually on the bottom and the bottom members were actually on the top. So um, when we figured out that the building, the town was looking at millions of dollars just to repair uh, or replace the roof, uh, we kind of said to ourselves, well, it doesn't make sense to do that and not address these other things that we were hearing during the study. And for instance, and probably most, uh, you know, the site circulation was one thing we heard, but what we didn't expect to hear was that almost from day one, there were significant air quality issues in this building, and there had been a number of attempts to try to uh, mitigate uh, mitigate issues that the staff was having, the children were having. Um, there are all sorts of health, health records that we went through. Uh, and we said to ourselves, well, if we're gonna do the, the roof, uh, we really need to figure out what's going on with the air quality in the building. So we expanded our study and um, we did cores through the floor. We took uh, uh, moisture uh, measurements in the concrete and the, and the retaining walls, the floor. Uh, really, there was nothing that was showing up from the concrete, so it was not a question of groundwater or surface water coming in and getting into the building. So the next thing that we did was we opened up from the inside some of the exterior walls, and we found that, it, again, it was kind of poor construction, but uh, even though a building looks, it's brick and it looks solid, uh, what people don't always understand is that brick is a porous material and it always absorbs water, always, through the mortar joints or through the brick itself. And as, as designers, uh, everyone, we realize this and the way buildings are properly designed is there's brick. Behind the brick there's an airspace and then there's a stud wall with uh, waterproofing. So we, we understand that the water is going to come through the brick but it's gonna hit this waterproofing and fall down this cavity, and then it's gonna go out at the bottom. Unfortunately, when the building was constructed, the cavity at the bottom of the walls was chock full of mortar, uh, and it was covering up all the, all the ways for the water to get out, uh, back out to the outside of the building. And so the, these walls, uh, all the brick that you see on the outside of the building, behind them, there's a tremendous amount of moisture that's just trapped in the building. And that moisture was getting sucked into the building uh, and causing all these health issues. Hmm. So what does that mean? It means if you were to, and we told the town, if you were to uh, work with this building, you're not only looking at repairing the roof, but you'd really have to strip the entire exterior shell off the building go down to the steel studs and the steel columns and rebuild the entire outside of the building as well. And then on top of that, all the water damage uh, that has occurred from the ice dams or from the actual roof collapse, because when the roof collapsed, it froze the uh, fire protection system, and so that burst, and there was a huge flood in Central House. So between the roof, the exterior skin, and all the damage you see, uh, you know, without, without drywall, without floor finishes as you look around, uh, this thing was turning into a multi, multi-million dollar issue. And uh, that's when the district uh, applied to the MSBA for assistance in funding um, a study to look at either reuse of the building or uh, a new construction. So one of the concerns that we've uh, seen mentioned in some of the discussions online and in person have been uh, how many grades would be in this building um, 
pre-K through grades uh, to explain what that actually means. It's actually four grades. Correct. In fact, we had to have two possible grade configurations that we submitted to MSBA. One was a pre-K three and the other was a pre-K uh, two. Um, one thing that uh, MSBA also asks of us is that, um, you know, we, we design uh, a space that is um, able to expand should we have further growth in population or we need to uh, put some expansion in terms of space uh, onto the existing site. So uh, with the pre-K through two, uh, because again, we looked at our enrollments in our, uh, you know, our K through uh, four population seemed to be on the rise within uh, the community. Uh, we felt as though um, having this become a pre-K two gave us that room for expansion, where really right now the way this site currently sits in the, in the footprint of this building is, you would not have any room to expand or extend or, or uh, put an actual renovation and addition onto this site. Um, but that also has a ripple effect throughout the district, um, which which um, many people in the community may not understand. Currently, we have four grade levels over at the Williams Intermediate School. We obviously want to um, alleviate that. So that would then become the grades three through five school. And then the old high school, which was the uh, Bridgewater Middle School prior to the collapse, would then become a grades six through eight, which is a lot more conducive to a middle school population than just that seven, eight population that we had here uh, on the Bridgewater side. On the on the Rainham side, the middle school is actually five through eight. So um, from, a, from a regional standpoint, it allows us a little bit more better alignment and why people would say, well, why is that important? It's because we're a region. We want to make sure that we are presenting a program that's equitable on both sides of the district. And by doing this, uh, becoming a pre-K-2, it allows us, again, for that first and foremost, that expansion piece to be um, uh, a possibility for us in the future should we need it. But it also helps us align the district um, from a programmatic standpoint as well so that our students in Bridgewater are receiving the same type of services and programs that our students in Rainham are. One concern that we've had here from a public safety perspective is administration being able to uh, commute from one side of the campus to the other. Correct. Um, down at the distal end, if you're facing the building all the way to the right, that is uh, the south house, and the middle is obviously the central house, and then all the way to the left. Uh, is, is the North House. What's con one concerning piece uh, is that if there was an issue on uh, the North House side uh, of, of the site, the South House does not fully connect to the North House. You actually have to go down a flight, come up to uh, another stairwell to get to this. So it's not an easy flow from the main level from one house to the next. So that's definitely concerning, especially when time is of the essence in an emergency situation involving students and staff. One of the complaints or concerns that we always hear from parents, regardless of elementary school, high school, college, is parking and traffic flow and people figuring out where to go and all the traffic jams that we have. and. Mitchell, of course, had a history of having some uh, traffic concerns on this property. Yes, uh, th this site was really not conducive to the amount of traffic flow that we had off of South Street. Uh, we had that uh, one entryway off of South Street that was for both uh, pedestrian traffic, uh, cars, and for our buses and vans. So it made it for a very difficult uh, commute in in the morning and a very uh, difficult dismissal in the afternoon. Uh, the new design does have um, a access road that goes off uh, the, the back side of the building um, past uh, the senior center to Route 18. That would be for buses only. Uh, but what that will do is alleviate a lot of that congestion up front with the buses and allow us more of a conducive traffic flow for our uh, parents for a parent pickup. Um, also, it would be a situation where we are going to be adding uh, additional parking spaces uh, to the site as well. Uh, that's something that came up uh, throughout uh, the uh, 
pre-schematic design that we felt as though we needed to put some of that um, additional space in. Our town has grown uh, exponentially in the last couple of years, especially with our uh, K through four population. So we felt as though that was an important piece to it, especially too because we have what is we do not have what's called a rolling drop-off uh, pickup anymore in the afternoon. Parents are actually have to come into the site and actually sign out their students. So they're going to need that additional uh, parking space. So the site design, we spent a lot of time taking a look at it, and we were able to uh, widen the entrance at South Street and create a dedicated bus lane that loops around the back of the building and will either pick up or drop off uh, many children uh, kind of at the community or the gymnasium cafetorium uh, wing on the lower level. The parents will be on the completely uh, separate loop on the front of the building. And as Derek mentioned, there'll be uh, adequate parking so that everyone can park, come in and pick up their, their children. The other uh, aspect is that um, there are a number of special needs buses uh, and so we have a separate kind of loop for them too. The whole, the whole idea was to take traffic off of South Street, eliminate congestion, and have people flow through this site. It, I know um, uh, going out back toward the senior center is only gonna be a 20 minute uh, event twice a day, once uh, after drop off, the buses will exit, and also after pickup. So the design team met with uh, public safety, uh, tra with a traffic consultant and the senior center to work out a plan to safely exit these buses onto Route 18. And part of that, uh, the outcome of that meeting was that the project will need to incorporate some type of wayfinding and separation so that when you pull into the senior center it's clear where you go and then the lane that'll be established for the buses that'll only be used twice a day for about 20 minutes for each bus queue. Uh, it'll be clear that the buses have this path and the seniors would, would have this path to enter and exit. We think that will avoid any conflicts. And like anything, once you get, get used to it, it'll just come second nature. And there really was very little conflict with people coming in in the morning uh, when buses are going out. And I believe in the afternoon there was absolutely, there was no conflict. I think the activities at the senior center were over uh, before the buses um, dismissed.